Hey everybody, welcome back to Final Resonance TV and episode number 19 of Van Halen Stories. Today my guest is the legendary rock photographer Niels Lozauer. Neil, if you if you know anything about Neil, you know Neil's been at this for 50 years, right Neil? 50 plus. 50 plus. Shooting every famous rock star you can think of. And he was like one of the, uh, well a lot of people say he was the fifth member of Van Halen, especially in the early days. And, uh, you know, this is this program's all about Van Halen, so we're going to get into that. He's got a new book out called Ed, Ed by Zalos, right here. We're going to go through this book a little bit and uh, look at some pictures and talk, talk about some stories. That book, you know, how long did that take you to put together? Well, I mean, it took me since 1978 to put it together in reality. But, you know, that's, that's my second edward book and it's probably my six, sixth book i have in total well that looks like six string heroes there. yeah you looks like you got the whole lows collection dude i got it all man look i got that one and of course you yeah. yeah. well yeah but you don't have well you have all the the van halen books you don't have the motley and you don't have the fuck you rock and roll portraits book by the way Am I allowed to cuss on this thing? You're allowed to do anything you want to do, brother. You do whatever. And is this live or is this recorded? It's recorded. I'll, you know, if I stick my foot down. Okay, my throat, fine. I'll, I, just want, I just wanted to know. Okay. <laughs> no, I always give myself a chance to, to right any wrongs before I put it out there. <laughs> so okay. I, got a, I got a question for you. You know, your, your documentary, In Your Face, if you guys haven't had a chance to check out his documentary, In Your Face, it's, it's such a great documentary. And what those guys that, you know, the, the artists that are on there say about your photography, you know, seeing your name all those years and in those pictures, you know, that's kind of how I came upon you too. You know, just seeing your name over and over and over in these, in all the magazines, of course, that were out, you know, the guitar magazine, I'm a guitar player, obviously, but, but, um, you know, Cream and, and back then, you know, I, a lot of the younger people wouldn't know this, but back then there wasn't any media like we have now it was the photography and that was basically all we had except for midnight special and don kirshner's rock concert and a couple of things like that to see an artist i remember when beat it came out and somebody told me who you know mentioned eddie van halen's name and i didn't have a face or anything but then what happened is i saw the unchained video on don kirshner's rock concert and i suddenly realized this is the eddie van halen guy right so after that i went to buy the album the, the album for Fair Warning, right? But I didn't know what album it was. So I went into you the started, record. You started late. What are you talking about? What about I know. I, little, I'm young. I, I, I'm young. young I know. I know. But, but what happened was I, I went in the store. I, could, I couldn't figure out which record it was because, you know, I just saw it once. It wasn't like I had a chance to even really let it sink in. I looked at the back of this album and I saw this picture that you took. This one right here. That one. And I go, that looks that looks like the video. That must be the album. So I bought that album because of Niels Lozauer. <laughs> in your photo. It's the wrong album, but <laughs> but that what was, was it. that diver that was diver down there, right? Yeah, the back of that, yeah. Yeah. That's, That's a great diver photo. Down. Great photo. I mean, you know. But it really started my whole journey with, with Van Halen. Of course, I went straight back to all the other records when I got some allowance and just bought everything there was from then on out. But Anyway, you know, you're, you're uh, saying you're a, you're a car guy. So I thought we'd start out with something, something, something crazy. All right, here's a, here's a crazy one. All right, since you were around Eddie Van Halen back in the day, he had a Countach. I talked to Steve Rosen about his Countach. He wrote in the right. Countach. Did you write in the Countach? Never. <laughs> Did you write? Well, I knew Eddie before he had any money. So when I first met him, he was driving this little <laughs> piece of shit Peugeot. <laughs> Right. And I don't know. I think if you look in Van Halen, a visual history, I think in 1978, there's a picture of Dave in midair with his legs out and his arms out. And underneath is Ed's Peugeot with, I think, an out of state license plate. So Dave actually jumped off the trunk lid of Eddie's Peugeot. That's why he's like in the air with his arms out and everything like that. But then he bought a a 57, 58 poor speedster from a friend of mine when he started making some money. And I knew Ed, he had a lot of cars, you know, but I never rode in that Countach. 
Yeah, he didn't keep it long. I don't know why. I think it's probably because Kuntosh is not a very easy car to drive. <laughs> expensive, probably, at the uh, time. Well, well, at the time, it was expensive. Now, they're a million-dollar-plus cars. You know, back then, right. it was probably fifteen, twenty thousand when Ed bought it. You know? Right, right, right. Carlos Cavazzo had one, too. I had a white one. No, he actually had... Oh, yeah, he had a uh, – there was a Countach, and what was the other one? Diablo. I think he had a Countach also, yeah. No, yeah. no. Eddie yeah. had Lamborghini Muras when I knew him. Right. He didn't have he didn't have a Countach or a Diablo. He had a Mura, Eddie. I don't know what you said before, but now that I'm thinking it wasn't a Countach. It was a Mura. Okay. So those are million-dollar-plus cars. Countaches are – Three, four, five hundred thousand dollars, you know. So the mirror is the that's the shit, you know. Right, right, right. So let's get into this book. Um, when you heard Van Halen, from what I read in this book and also in some of your history, you first saw them, I guess, at Texas Jam. Is that right? That was the very first time I ever saw them live. Yes. Right, right. And then you ended up at Day on a Green. After that, no, I think after that, after that, I shot them live. They were finishing their tour and they played a show in San Diego at the sports arena. And then they came up and played Long Beach Arena. But when I say arena, they probably had the venue, you know, it wasn't full 18,000 or 16,000, whatever they hold. They probably, you know, the you know, the promoters were good at roping off. So if they sold 5,000 tickets, they just put a curtain up and wouldn't use the whole venue. So so you shot them in, indoor or outdoor the first time? I shot them, never shot them at Texas Jam because Monk came up to me when I was getting ready to shoot him, Noel, from the rest of the Soul and Peace. So Noel came up to me, who I didn't know at the time, and basically said, get the fuck off my fucking stage. You know, even though I was shooting... All the bands with a friend of mine, Barry Levine, we were hired by the promoter back then to shoot all the bands. We had full access to go on stage, off stage, anywhere we wanted to go. So I was on stage. It was probably 110 degrees. And, you know, right five minutes before, Monk came up to me like, what the fuck are you doing here? Well, I'm shooting all the bands for the promoter. And, you know, we have access and we're cleared to shoot all the bands anywhere we want. Well, you could shoot it any of the bands wherever you want except my band van halen so get the fuck off my stage and i was like <laughs> even though monk was about three feet tall but he was the most intimidating looking guy i ever met in my life up to that point you know you got to remember monk used to be the tour manager for the sex pistols so he just had to deal with the worst bullshit you could possibly imagine that any tour manager you know i mean the sex pistols had the reputation of being you know probably the most brutal, you know, unmanageable, untamable band at that point in music. So, you know, they could do no right, only wrong. And <laughs> right. I, I had a, uh, I had a couple of year uh, relationship with Monk there before he died. And, and so I had a lot of conversation with him. He actually sent me his book on the Sex Pistols and, and we had a lot of conversations about his history. It's a pretty interesting history in his book. I don't know. Have you read his book on Van Halen? I re well, yes, my cover photo on Monk's book. That was an interesting shot, too. I can tell you stories about that. But, <laughs> yeah, I read that. I think I read it on a plane to Nashville one day. It was good. There was a lot of stuff I didn't know. I mean, I, I had my viewpoint. Obviously, Monk was with him almost on a daily basis. Sure. But even just like me, people were like, oh, you went on tour with him? Well, I didn't go on tour like, you know, 200 days a year because I worked with other bands at the same period. You know, you you know, every show, whether they're playing Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, Cincinnati, Cleveland, they're all the same. The backdrops are the same. It's the same clothes, usually the same songs. Usually Dave's raps were the same between songs. So you don't need to go on to 200 shows. That's, you know. Right, right. Well, you got, I mean, the amount of photos you got, though, I mean, it's just unbelievable. I mean. Yeah. As I go on the internet, you know, and, and look for photos of Van Halen, it's like it's never ending. Like there are so many yeah. photos. Well, probably you go on the internet. I mean, I don't know if you're thinking about my photos, but, you know, I get ripped off on a daily basis. If I go to Instagram or Facebook, there's thousands and thousands of my photos. I mean, I think people buy these books and cut it, cut the pages out, scan them and just put them <laughs> all over social media. 
And let me tell you something, Jeff. There's nothing I love more in my <laughs> old age than to go after the infringers who will legally use my photos. If you know how much money I made going after these people who ripped me off and we settle out of court, it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a tough, tough situation, right? You know, with all of this digital everything. You know, w welcome to the, you know, the. 22nd century whatever <laughs> well a book like this though man i want to ask you about this particular photo the one with oh, bill graham the one with bill graham in it there now for some reason i thought bill graham was an old guy that he must be about 40 there or less right yeah probably i mean he died tragically young you know in a, i think a helicopter crash i, I can't remember if he That's was right. with stevie Ray when that helicopter went down. I don't remember. He died in a plane crash, a helicopter crash. But that was the first photo shoot I actually did with Van Halen. And they were playing a day on the green. Right. And, you know, after they saw my photos from Long Beach and San Diego, they're like, hey, well, let's come up this you know, day on the green and shoot us. And, you know, they got on fairly early that day. And they just, you know, that was backstage. So that green, yellow, and orangey red fence i was just so people couldn't see in the backstage area so i just you know sometimes back in my early early days of being a photographer you gotta you know you get somewhere and you look around and go okay well th that looks like it could be cool for photos and this is this peeling paint wall is really good and this beat up old car is good and you get the band in there that was you know no lighting that's just mother nature available light and stuff like that and I shot the band, and if you look at those photos, especially of Dave, they were pretty rough back then. You know, by 84, the band had a more polished look, but if you look at Dave and his makeup, and you right. look at Michael, and you look at Alex, that was them in their early days. You know, that was like before. But they still had this, we're going to be huge rock star looks on their face. I mean, you could see it in that show. They just obliterated, you know, obliterated every other band on the venue. I mean, it was incredible that show. Look at, I mean, they're playing to probably 50,000 people back then in Oakland that day. Right. You know, they were, they were, like I said in the book, I think I said, oh yeah, they were on fire. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. Right, right. What was the atmosphere at that show like? I asked Steve Rosen, but Steve Rosen missed Van Halen because he was interviewing ACDC. <laughs> yeah, but I have shots of Steve with Ed backstage. I think, you know, I introduced Steve. Steve said he met Ed, I think, at the Starwood. Some girl introduced him, but I don't know. I don't know that. But I think that's when, I, you know, obviously, by then I was already sort of getting in tight with the band, and I introduced Steve Dead said, Ed, this guy's a really famous writer and you should do something with them. And, you know, he writes for guitar players. Steve's one of the most incredible writers I ever met in my life. I mean, he gave me a lot of quotes for my six string hero book. And I've known Steve since about 1972. Right. And that's a long time in this day. We're both still alive. I mean, for me, it's, <laughs> I'm still around. Y'all are doing, are doing good. He, he, uh, he's doing good. I mean, I, I've got his new book. I'm working my way through that right now, in fact. So this one right here, the White Les Paul. Is this yes. San, San Diego? Or do you know? San Diego or Long Beach. You know, it's one of the two. I think one night was San Diego, one night's Long Beach. But that's, you know, it's pretty rare seeing it. I don't think I ever saw him use that guitar after that tour again. Right, right. He uh, he bought that in New Orleans, apparently. And he was trying to, apparently trying to replace the shark, which is this next picture that, that he was, you know, he cut up. Uh, yeah, the, oh, that guitar, yeah, yeah. The, well, I don't know too much. I don't play guitars. I mean, obviously, I know Les Pauls and Strats, and, right, and right. I deal with everybody, all the companies, Schecter, ESP, Fender, Gibson, you name it, you know. But, yeah, that was that photo there was shot when they were doing their photos for the second Van Halen right. album. So. Right, which is actually these same pictures, right? Yeah, those are after they fired the first photographer who did Van Halen one. And and honestly, I thought Van Halen one, the photos were just incredible, amazing. The band told me they never really liked those photos. I'm like, you know, that was trend setting to me. Sure. But they hired the same guy to do the second album shoot. And the guy rented the sound stage. I mean, it was 
you know, on a one to 10, it was a 10,000. What he did, he had, you know, 50,000 assistants and rented whatever, you know, I'm over exaggerating $10 million with, with the photo gear, which he needed, you know, a thousand dollars. He rented 10 million, but anyway, he had, you know, the, well, the band what knew they were doing the photo shoot. So I think they stopped by and said, Hey, as well as, you know, we're going to do our own shoot. Why don't you come hang with us? So when they were shooting Al who went first to do his drumsticks on fire, I was hanging in the parking lot with Ed and Dave and Michael. And then Dave went next. And then that's when the photographer had him jump off the drum riser like eight, 10 times. Mm -hmm. And I guess one time he broke his ankle and then they called it a wash. And about a week later, they wanted to see the photos. And so they called the guy in. I, I have a few of those photos are some of the worst photos I've ever seen in my life. I don't know how he did Van Halen one or what the art director did back, back then. Cause there was no Photoshop or Lightroom to tweak the photos. But for a guy who did Van Halen one, which I thought was so trend setting the stuff I saw from Van Halen two, he did might as well throw it in the trash. And I guess the band felt that way also. So they fired him. And I got the call, I think from Pete Angelus, who to me was always the fifth member of Van Halen, not me, Pete Angelus. I think right, right. like, look, yeah, we need to, we need to, finish the shoot so we need someone to shoot ed and michael and you know uh, but you have to look at what this photographer did with dave and alex and you sort of have to match the lighting and match the color of the backdrop and everything like that so they asked me if i wanted to do it because the, the guys liked me we they felt at home with me we were like family we all like the same stuff in life so uh so I finished that. So yes, those photos of Ed that you just showed me, that was when the photographer was shooting them and we were hanging in the parking lot, okay. which also is where Dave was jumping off of Ed's Peugeot. But what do you got? So I finished the rest of the shoot. And by then, Dave had the broken ankle. So I found the three nurses. One, I think was Lynn. She was uh, the guy from The Babies, John Waite's girlfriend. Then there was a girl, Valerie London, who I was always in love with, you know, one of the blondes. And then there was a girl that worked at the Roxy. I can't remember her name. And she was the third nurse. And, you know, we just, you know, it was great back then. We were all young. It was a whole different day. You know, was it wasn't now everything's business and formal and every time a record company buys a photograph or should I say licenses a photograph from me or whatever. They always got to send you a contract. There was none of that back then in the seventies. You know, you wrote them an invoice, use of photos on album cover. And that was it. Now you get a 20 page contract from Warner brothers or Electra or whoever it is, you know, and you know, they always try to rip you off in the contract too. So. Yeah. yeah I noticed that Dave, Dave, uh, Dave and Eddie shared that, that blue, shirt at different times <laughs> they were sometimes i don't i don't remember dave ever wearing that shirt you know, i thought it's oh, always... wait a second. i can't hold on let me put my old man glasses on oh maybe that one dave yeah in the 78 tour i think i have some shots of him wearing that silver thing i thought you were talking about the shirt eddie was wearing on the cover of my van halen book which is my first book no no, so, no. and it's and it's funny because my art director actually changed the colors of Ed's shirt on the cover of Van Halen, A Visual History. If I think in that new book, which is color here, you can see Eddie wearing that same shirt, but the colors are different than on the cover of Van Halen, right, Visual no, History. Oh, no, that shirt. Yeah, yeah. So that's how it is. But hold up the Van Halen Visual History book, which I think you have. So if you look, that's the exact same shirt, but see how it's red on Van Halen visual history and it's blue and whatever on uh, Eddie Vice Low. So just a little trivial for all you Van Halen fanatics who like to you know, look at Ed's pedals and everything. So that's how it should really be, the Ed buys lows. Right, so, right. So question for you on these photos. Now, I know these, these came from Noel's collection that he had. Well, they didn't come from Noel's collection. Noel had them. Okay. In his personal thing, I don't know how he ever got it because, like I said in the book, you know, when I did that photos that day, I had a shitload of Dave, a shitload of nurses, a shitload of Michael Anthony. I never shot Al because Al was done by the first guy. And uh, 
But I only had like four or five, six shots of Ed. And I'm like, where the hell are all my Ed shots? You know, you know, that's, you know, money in the bank for me having those shots. Sure. So, uh, you know, I thought Warner Brothers had them for some reason. Me trying to get them back from Warner Brothers, I might as well just, you know, slip my throat because it's never going to happen. Sure. But then one day my friend Michael Strider called me up. And he's like, hey, are these yours? And he was, you know, no. I guess finally said, I don't need this crap anymore. He's getting rid of his gold albums and his tour coats. So he was having an auction by my friend Jacques at Backstage Auctions. And so my friend, uh, Michael Strader, was like, are these yours? And I went, I'm like, damn, there, there's my Eddie shots. I haven't seen those in 40 years. So I called up Jacques at Backstage Auction. And I called him Nolan and said, look, man, you don't own these. These are mine. I own the copyright. You may have the physical slides, but I own them. So sure. I need him back. And Noel, being a gentleman, someone I respected, and Jacques as a gentleman, they said, yeah, no problems, Lowe's, we'll send them back to you. So those shots are the first time that they're basically ever being seen in my Ed Buys Lowe's book. Even I didn't have them for 40 years. So, you know, one or, you know, I think right before Ed died, the cover guitar player had a shot of Ed, which is in that book, and that was the cover. That was one I had, but... You know, I only had four or five shots from that shoot. Now I have about 50 or 60, thanks to Monk and, you know, Jacques, and they sent them back to me. So let me ask you about that. I mean, those particular slides now, you're going to have to educate me because I only took, like, Photography 101 for a minute in high school. That's fine. But basically, you get a slide, your normal, your normal slide, right? Well, not your slide, your negative, right? Then you print a slide well, from no, that. No, 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 no. It, it was a slide. That was actually, you go to the store like Sammy's Camera, you buy film, negative film. The amateurs would shoot negative color film because there was a lot more leeway for error on the exposures. Okay. The professionals would shoot slide film, which you had to be more exact in what you were doing. You couldn't be as sloppy when you were shooting. If you were like, a stop underexposed or a stop overexposed, you might as well throw it in the trash with slide film. Negative color film, you could be sloppy with and still get acceptable results. But the stuff that Noel had was the actual film that went through my cameras that day. So that's what he had. And that's what I got back from him 40 years later after I shot it. Because instead of originals, I just kept figuring out. Like, okay. Original slides. Yeah, they weren't dupes that you take the original and you go somewhere and say, hey, I need a duplicate slide, you know, because I don't want to send out the original to magazine. And they give you a dupe. But that's an inferior duplicate of the original because the original is the highest quality. Every time you make a duplicate, you're losing quality, you know, because it's a copy. So they're taking the original and copying it. So he just had them in his possession because you had sent them to him at one point. They were reviewing. I don't know. He, he, he must have got them from the record company. I never sent them. I probably either gave all the photos when we were done to Pete Angelus, who turned them into the record company. I don't remember. It's a, quite a few brain cells ago for me. I lost many cells. Don't forget the bands I hung with. You know, right. they, I know. They were, you know, <laughs> they were the bad bands, you know. They were wild. Now, I was going to show you this. This picture at sunset. I was gonna, I was gonna ask you if you realize that all of these, all of these replicas of guitars that are made, people are using some of your photos to make that happen, right? Yeah. Well, Ed actually, when Gibbs, uh, sorry, when Fender was gonna duplicate those, Ed came over my studio. Oh yeah. And well, yeah. I mean, he's been here many times. I'm at the same place. I did all my Van Halen shoots. I've been where I'm sitting right now since '79. But Ed came by. And he was in a good mood and, you know, and to make a long story short, he picked out because this is before they made any replicas at all. So he looked at my 78 photos and he pulled out about 20 <coughs> and he said, OK, Lowe's, these are the ones, you know, I need. So he and so before he left, he's like, I'm going to take these with me. And I'm like, well, no, well, well, well hold on. Ed. What do you mean you're going to take these with you? Yeah, well, I need I got to take them and study them and I'm going to give them to Fender so that no, nah, no, nah, dude, you ain't going to get these photos from me. He goes, what do you mean? He's getting all pissed now. He goes, what do you, he goes, what do you mean? I go, dude, now that you got to remember, this is probably in 1999, 2000, 2001. I go, 
dude, I'm not going to give you these photos that you're going to take home to your house and leave them laying around and you'll be smoking cigarettes and dropping ashes on them or spilling wine on them or losing them or whatever. No, no, no. You aren't taking these photos. What do you mean? These are my guitar. I'm like, sorry, Ed. So so he, he left there in a tizzy and was all pissed off at me. And, you know, I was like, oh, fuck, Ed's mad at me. But, you know, I didn't care. I'm not going to give him those. I know Ed. I knew Ed. So the next day I come into the studio, there, there was a message and he must have been all drunk. And he's like, hey, as low as it's Ed, that was fun hanging out with you yesterday. <laughs> he was like a little goof. I must have had a couple of bottles of wine or something. I don't know. But he was all, he forgot that we he left in a tizzy. And I called him up and I said, look, Ed, I'll make you some dupes of these, which we were just talking about duplicate slides from the originals right, right. and I'll send them to the people of Fender, but I'm not going to give you the originals period. It's not going to happen. So, so well, we, we had, are fine. We had a guest. I had a guest on here. Uh, that was the guy who provided him with the, uh, bootlegs that he, he pulled the material from for that final Van Halen album, different kind of truth. And when they, when he provided him like 10 CDs full of this stuff, Eddie's house got worked on. And it all disappeared. <laughs> so Eddie uh, had to call yeah. him. You had to call him back. Yeah. You had to call him back and get him again. <laughs> well, it's funny because one of the last times I saw Ed, I was having dinner with him and my old good friend Michael Carlin, who was I got the gig as Van Halen's CPA in 1979. My friend Michael Carlin was there with Dave, Sammy, Gary, Sammy, and Dave, and then he became. Michael Anthony's business manager in about 1980, 81. And then he became Ed's business manager in, you know, 2002, 2003. I mean, I made my friend Michael Carlin millions and millions of dollars in his career. But so we were having dinner and I we went to this Japanese place. And it's funny because, you know, I'm a big foodie. And so we'd go there and Ed when he, you know, me, when I eat Japanese food, I get some Toro, I get some Uni, I get some Amachi, I get some Aguro, I get some Ikura, whatever. Ed would, the chick would come over and Ed was like, yeah, I want like eight orders of Maguro, which is tuna. And I was like, Ed, why don't you get some Amachi or why don't you get some Toro or why don't you get some Munagi, some meal? He's like, oh man, because I know I like this stuff. So instead of experimenting, he would get eight orders of the exact same thing, you know, but I brought Ed some some bootlegs which were cream bootlegs because he loved he didn't like Jimi hendrix said ed loved eric clapton okay right, right, and right. so so i i open up this envelope i go here he goes where are these i go oh there's some cream bootlegs i know how much you like cream so i brace he goes you know he goes loves uh, he goes I, I think he called me neil dave always called me neil too they they never always loved but what do you call it uh, so he goes, you know, I, I, I don't need these. They go, well, what do you mean? They're, they're, you know, they're fucking amazing. He goes, I, I don't really listen to music. I, I think Ed was such an innovator that he didn't really want to be influenced by other people's music. So mm -hmm. he sort of shut himself out from the world. So everything he did, I mean, he was to me an innovator on the guitar. I mean, he's obviously one of the best guitarists in the history of guitar playing, but. You know, he was an innovator, so I don't think he wanted to be influenced by Brian May or whoever it was at the time that was, you know, S you know Steve Vai or Joe Satriani or whoever, Eric Johnson, Joe, he, he wanted to do his own thing, and so he didn't even take the bootlegs, so I guess the bootlegs you're talking about are ones, which I probably have those same bootlegs, too, sure. I probably have a hundred Van Halen bootlegs, but... Yeah, they go back. Probably, yeah, yeah, they're yeah. all the club, the club day shows... A friend of the uh, a friend of the camp, uh, somebody that lived with Dave and Dave's. There was somebody that lived with Dave and Dave's guest house, and that person did reel to reel recordings of the band. And this guy sourced all the original reel to reels, digitized all these, so he had fresh digital copies. And Alex and and Eddie almost released a live album off of these things. <laughs> the guy, the guy. Was, uh, the guy himself said, "I didn't, I didn't want him to do it. it. wasn't really. He said it wasn't really an album, but, but they were thinking about it, and <laughs> they, they didn't yeah. know." Uh, I mean, I have some bootlegs 
One's called Midnight Cash. Uh, the other one's called, I think, Young and Wild. They're yeah. from 78. I mean, Midnight Cash, Warner Brothers could take this from me. They don't even have to remaster it. That's how brilliant it is. And they could come out with a live Van Halen 1978. And honestly, Dave, all these guys on a 1 to 10, Michael, Alex, Dave, Ed, on a 1 to 10, they're like a 10,000. This performance is just incredible. But I got a lot of old Van Halen bootlegs, you know, but these two in particular. And the funny thing is, I think Young and Wild is the exact same bootleg as Midnight Cash, but the bootleggers are all thieves anyway. So the guy that came out with Young and Wild probably found Midnight Cash, took it, and made a bootleg out of that and called it something else, except the Young and Wild has a little bit more hiss on it than Midnight Cash. <laughs> That's right. All right, this one right here. Dave's House. Now, one of, the, one, of the things, one of the things I want to ask you about, Dave's House, did you go to Eddie's house? You know what? Back then, no, I never did go to Ed's house. Well, all the photo shoots we did back then were all at Dave's house. I mean, if you look in 78, there's probably 10 different setups that we did at Dave's house. I mean, so, sure. you know, sure. Eddie and Al... I mean, you know, not, that was Dave's father's house. I put it who was a, I think he was an ophthalmologist or an op, optrici uh, optrician or a, whatever it is. But so, you know, he made good money. Yeah, that's a Dave's house too. That's the one where the art director asked me to get him to smile, which is the photo, I think, on the right. right. And I'm like, you know, I mean, the art director was like, yeah, go get a Frisbee, take him to the park. You know, we don't want this tough guy image we want a happy i'm like well, what are you fucking crazy take a fucking frisbee and go to the park with them that's not gonna work <laughs> yeah but they became kind of the they became kind of this well this is what ryan your buddy ryan called them smile rock <laughs> the, wait, wait, ryan cook yeah he, i remember he said to me one time they were like smile rock like they they, well, they, I, they I sort don't of no i mean it was, it was, they were sort of party rock. I wouldn't call them smile okay. rock, but party rock. I mean, Eddie always was smile. He was a happy go lucky kid when I knew him. I mean, right. you know, I'd come up and see Eddie grab me and hug me. And, you know, last time I saw him at that restaurant with my friend Michael Carl, you know, we were leaving. He grabbed me so hard and hugged me so hard that he broke my glasses that were hanging off my shirt. You know, I mean, you know, the Ed I knew, yeah, I mean, he obviously changed over the years. And like I learned from my mentor, Buddha, everything changes, nothing stays the same. So, you know, when I saw him probably in 98 or whatever it was before my first book, Ed book came out, you know, that Ed was not the same Ed I met in 78, but I, the Zlows he was talking to then wasn't the same Zlows that he knew from 78, you know, so... Lots of time. Here's the crazy outfits that you didn't like. <laughs> yeah, I didn't like that. I mean, I'm looking at Michael Anthony. He looks like the Mexican waiter. And, you know, <laughs> Al, Al looked like he should be in Ohio Players or the Commodores or something with that shirt. And Eddie's wearing a fur coat. You know, Dave looked okay, though. Dave, you know, Dave sort of, I think, helped those guys dress to some degree. I mean, image back then was very, very important for a <laughs> rock band. You know, and, you know, Dave had a good sense of style and everything like that. And he sort of, you know, I mean, it's sort of like when I did the first photo shoot with Rat. I remember Robin and uh, and uh, Steven, you know, they helped sort of tell Warren what to wear. And, you know, they they had more of a vision on style and stuff like that. Eddie and Al were amazing musicians, but sometimes they needed a little help with clothes and stuff at, at photo shoots, you know. So did Pete Angelus, when did he get involved in all their, all their kind of like, the, you said he was kind of, you know, he was, I think he was listed as creative director or whatever at some point or whatever, but how much did Pete have influence on what they wore, how much he, you know, all the other stuff, lighting and all that too, I know. Well, well, Pete was with the band. I mean, Pete used to be the lighting director at the Whiskey, right. and I forgot what happened. I, I think I read somewhere, but. He said something to someone. I think he got fired. Uh, yeah. I don't know the exact thing. He got fired, but the Van Halen boys who were playing the whiskey, which I never saw them once then. Okay. Uh, I guess they liked Pete and liked 
the lights that they did. I mean, you know, back then they were wet under the ears. They weren't the big rock stars they were in 1984. So they took Pete under their gun and Pete became their LD, lighting director. But Pete and Dave, I guess, hit it off and they were the best of friends. And I guess, you know, why? well, Ed and Al, you know, the brothers were, you know, and, and Ed and Al loved each other. They were some of the closest brothers I ever met in my whole entire life. But Pete and Dave, to me, were the ones that were plotting the strategies for all the publicity stunts, and they were designing the stage, and they were the ones that had a lot to do with the business end. I think Ed and Al had more to do with the musical, uh, you know, end of things than Dave and Pete, you know, that really had a sense of, you know, how important it was for image and publicity. Like, you know, I went and saw them at Anaheim Stadium open up for uh, Black Sabbath in 78. And they did this thing where, you know, before they came on stage, they had this plane flying around. And then all of a sudden you saw four guys jumping out of the plane with a big VH on each one of their parachutes. And then all of a sudden, you know, you see him flying through the air for like five minutes. And then finally, you know, they hit the ground behind the stage. And then all of a sudden you see him come on stage with the parachutes in their hand. But obviously it wasn't them jumping out of the plane. But, you know, that was, you know, but to the people in the audience, that was like godlike, you know, seeing these four guys descend you know, from the plane and, you know, just things like that, you know. Right, right. They were great with that stuff. They're, they're show me, man. David Lee Roth, of course. Now, this picture, this is a cool picture. And I, I, it's the first time that I've seen two, two jumpsuits together in a picture, the red one and the pink one. A lot of people didn't realize he, well, he uh, had, the red one and the plane. Hold on, I got to put my old man glasses on again. Well, it's it. the same jumpsuit. I Ed's wearing the same. Okay. But you I said know. the red one and the pink one. Yeah, there's a red one there. Hanging across the Where? Door, hanging across the music stand. I would think that's a scarf or something like that. I don't know what that is. I can't really see it that Pretty sure it's a jumpsuit. Mean, anyway, uh, okay. it, it, could, it could, be, it could be. But the reason why I say that is because, you know, when uh, Women and Children first was shot with, with uh, Norma Seif, all those were black and white, right? But then it sucks. Actually... Like, actually What's they that? weren't okay because, like I said, right before I got on the phone with you, I was dealing with Dave's manager, Jerry Leonard, and I'm helping her do something. And Dave picked out like 109 photos from different photographers he wants to use for something. And I said, Hey, Jerry, there's two Norman C photos here from the cover of Women and Children First, and they are in color, just to let you know. Okay. So no, they are, aren't are all black and white. So some of them were color. You know? So the one I saw, he was wearing the red jumpsuit. For Forever, I thought it was just... But if it was black and white, how do you know it was the red jumpsuit? Exactly. So for years, I thought it was the pink jumpsuit from all your photos. But it turns out, of course, he had 10 jumpsuits. And he seemed like he did this with everything he wore. He had five different ones of the same thing, different colors. It could be. That one, I believe, was 100% pink. And then he came to my studio one day and did his shoot, and he was in the pink jumpsuit, too. That's there it is. Right. Yeah. yeah, De Definitely yeah. pink. <laughs> so funny, because people try to figure out where these jumpsuits came from. They're that, I mean, these you know, tribute bands like the one that you went and saw, uh, Van Halen? Van Halen. Van Halen. I just saw them. I saw them about a week ago, a week and a half ago. This band, look. For any of you out there that have never seen Van Halen with David Lee Roth in their heyday, go check out this band, Van Halen, F-A-N, Halen, H-A-L-E-N. They're amazing. I mean, you know, the, the drummer, the, the, everybody there, you know, Michael, the drummer, and all the guys are just, I, I love them. They were great. I mean, you know, the, the singer, I think his name's Ernie, he's got Dave down to a T. You yeah. know, just the raps between his arm. That I forgot the guy's name who plays Ed. You know, Derek. I got I'm losing some brain cells still, but Derek, and, and, you know, there's another one. You know, there's another one, Atomic Punks, and they're Derek. great too. Mm -hmm. You know, but I haven't seen them play for a while. And they had a few members change. I'm looking forward to seeing Atomic Punks again. But all I can say is, if Fan Halen comes to your neighborhood, do not miss them. Yeah. Period. Yeah, Derek. Derek is the guitar player. 
Derek, yeah, really nice guy. Great player, too. They're all great. The bass player. I forgot the other two. I know Michael better than all of them. He's the drummer, you know. And I saw him by accident because last January, or so I say January of this year, I went to go see Dave's last shows in uh, Las Vegas. And Dave canceled because of COVID. And my friend from uh, back east, I had a whole bunch of friends fly out from New York to see Dave. You know, my friend Eddie Zervagon, who I known forever he's like hey uh you know we ran into this singer andrew freeman who's one of the best singers on this planet andrew said if you want to see someone good tomorrow night go see this band fan halen so i went and oh my god they were fantastic to me i hate to say it dave but to me seeing fan halen uh, that was really great it was, I, i'm sort of glad you canceled your shows because i had an amazing time seeing fan halen so. Yeah, they're they're awesome band. Like you know, like like a lot of these bands, they really get to you, they take your photos, of course, and they like, where these jumpsuits are, where these outfits are. I mean, uh, okay. it's, it's so bad, Neil, that we look at the photos and we go 1980, 1978, 19. <laughs> you know, it's, it's that bad. So this is the shot with your uh, your your guitar shot, which is you know these two shots are iconic for guitar players like myself. You know, the guitar yeah, world. Well, the, the, the snake ones, whatever it is, I don't, I mean, yeah, it may look cool. I don't know how good that guitar sound. It probably sounded like shit. I don't think I ever saw Ed play it once, but. You know. he, played it, he played it in 80 for a little bit, but not not a lot. Yeah, he didn't play it all the time. I think, you know, he, <laughs> I think he had messed something up and he just said, here, do something with this. So when you were out there in 1981 with him, which is kind of like, you know, the tour that got me so excited about him. Right. I think I, I think I remember you saying that that was sort of their peak. You thought that was their peak. Was it eighty one or eighty two for you? Well, I don't know if there was a peak. I mean, their peak was nineteen eighty four, obviously with Jump and Hot for Teacher. Uh, yeah. I loved you know Van Halen one and Van Halen two and Women and Children first. As a matter of fact, the day after I saw Van Halen. I don't listen to too much Van Halen anymore. If, if I put some rock and roll on, it's usually Rival Sons, who to me is the best new band out there. And they aren't even new anymore because Pressure and Time's like over 10 years old. But that's right. what I put on. But the day after I saw Van Halen, I put on Women and Children first because Van Halen opened up with uh, Romeo Delight. Yeah. And that's just, you know, that's what Van Halen used to open up on the 80 tour. And it was just great, you know. Everybody wants some, um, and you know, uh, lost controls on that and everything. So I put on Women and Children first. Mean Street, uh, Fair Warning is a great album too, you know. Right, right. Diver down a lot of covers, but they're all great, you know. Sure. So I got a question for you, and you may not have a clue. <laughs> You're familiar with uh, the Where's Waldo children's book character? Are you familiar with that? With Waldo, like Waldo, the the children's character Waldo, who you go. Yeah, and, I know that. Okay, yeah, yeah, he was in the Hotford Teacher Waldo with the greasy well, hair. Yeah. Well, my my point is, is it is the person that they're trying to depict the person that is in these little things where you try to find Waldo on these children's books? Because I don't know you. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. Children's books. Okay. Well, mean, Waldo was the kid. Waldo was the kid in the Hot for Teacher video, I, I know, right? I know, but there's there, what happened is when I went out and started wearing this outfit, people started going, "You're Waldo," and I was like, "Well, no," but and then I realized there was the children's book where you go and you try to find Waldo, and Waldo is dressed like Eddie Van Halen. <laughs> He's got the striped shirt. Uh, but actually, in that video, if I remember, Waldo was not the Eddie Van Halen character. That's Waldo true. was some kid in just, you know, in I school, know. the like nerdy, goofy kid in, in, yeah. in that thing. Because I remember sort of what the Dave character looked like. I can't remember the Eddie, but none of those kids that were the characters that played the Van Halen characters, those weren't Waldo. Waldo was, you know, a different character in that video. Look, later, look it up. Where's Waldo book? Children's book. Yeah. And when you do, you'll see what I'm talking about. Because the kid is dressed. Okay. He's dressed just like this. And everybody comes up to me. But people that are not, who are not aficionados, think this is what I'm wearing. <laughs> and I'm not. <laughs> I'm wearing Eddie Van Halen's outfit. All right. So he, 
He loved these vertical vertical stripes. He had like 14 versions of these shirts. So they must have just bought all this stuff in bulk when they're on the road or something, right? <laughs> junk I don't know. Shirt. Actually, I never paid too much attention. You know, I'd see him at night, and they had he had the same clothes on every show, pretty much. He <laughs> had sometimes I think on the '84 tour, he had a couple different things, or he had a couple '83 had that. I think it was red and white stripes and black stripes jumpsuit. I don't know, but he pretty much, you know, every night I saw more of the same thing. This is a badass outfit, and when I see the video and you see him from profile, he's so young and his skin is so fresh, and he's such a baby back then. I love that picture though because it's the leather pants on it. Yeah, that Eddie would definitely was the coolest character out of all of them that day. You know, Al I think was the jungle character in the <laughs> the, in the TV, and Michael was a samurai, which is sort of cool too. You know, sort of fit Michael. You know, and yeah, yes, yeah, and and Dave was the Napoleon character, but he had a lot of makeup on Dave and. Eddie, Eddie to me had the coolest look that day. He looked great in that in that, that video when you see him, like I said, from the, the profile, you see how young he is. It's like, wow. This picture, how did you take this picture? I don't have this. Is, Jesus Christ. Where are you standing? I don't know. Well, I'm right in front of him, basically, probably on the ego ramp, you know. I, uh, just, I can't remember if that's the Us Festival. I don't think it is, but uh, it's I mean, by, by, yeah, by that tour, yeah, they had pretty big stage and everything. I mean, I had total access. I could go anywhere I wanted to. But, you know, you sometimes you'll be at a concert and you'll see photographers on the sides of the stage. And that's basically the photographers with the egos that want all the people in the audience to go, oh, look at that photographer. He's on stage with the band. He's so lucky. But the best shots are honestly down in front, looking up, you know, man making the fans and the audience's idols, you know, I mean, that's their idols. They go to the show. So you're sitting here and you're looking up on a stage like this going, Oh my God, look at Dave, listen to Ed, you know, it's not on stage. That's not, you know, but after you're on tour for 10 or 20 shows, you don't need to be on the same angle every night. So you try to get shoot Al from his drum riser, shoot Michael or whatever. I mean, there I'm on, on stage actually shooting is, you can see I'm higher than everybody else in the audience, you know. Awesome. It, it's funny. When, when we did this book, Ed Buys Lows, yeah. we, we made a point to go through all my other Van Halen books and make sure we didn't duplicate any photos right. in that. And, you know, back, I always had a big file of Ed photos. So if someone from a guitar magazine said, okay, we need Eddie Van Halen and Steve I and George Lynch or whatever, I would go to this one batch of photos of Ed and I knew these were good photos of Ed where he looked good. He didn't have double chins. They were sharp and focused. But when we did this book, my art director, you know, Daniel Gray, who is now also an amazing photographer, you know, he said, no, Neil, we ain't going to go through that thing. I'm going to start Van Halen 78 and I'm going to look at every slide you ever shot of the band and we're going to pull, I'm going to pull stuff that you've never probably even seen or picked before. So like that shot, I don't think I ever even saw it before if, if I was putting the book together. So Daniel pretty much went through and picked out shots that he thought would be great for the book. Those aren't as low as his pick. And that shot, my friend Randy uh, Johnson, who's a famous baseball player, he saw that picture and loved it. And he bought a big 16 by 20 print of that, you know, for his house. So Randy's a, a friend of mine and sort of a Niels Lozauer fan. He's a great guy, Randy Johnson. You know what, Randy Johnson, I was a, I'm was i a big baseball fan, so I followed power pitchers, Clemens, Randy Johnson, Nolan Ryan when I was growing up. And so, yeah, I, I know about Randy's other career in photography, and he, he's got some awesome shots. Some killer yeah, stuff. Yeah, well, Ran R Randy told me before he was ever a famous pitcher, he really wanted to be a photographer. But I guess all of a sudden he's going to school and started pitching. And, you know, the, I'm not a baseball guy. I watch motorcycle races every single day of my life. So right. I don't know anything about baseball or football or basketball. But from what I understand, Randy's, you know, one of the greatest pitchers that ever lived. So he definitely was. And one of the tallest ever. There you go. Yeah. Uh, us Festival. Now that's that's Us Festival. I know. That's Us Festival. What's cool about that, though, is, you know, when I saw this on TV, 
I never realized there was that much production. It didn't seem like that big, but it looks killer. That's a lot of work putting that US festival on for, you know, uh, I mean, I hated being there. That was so much work for three days. By, by the third day, the next day after that was the last day, and I was sharing a room with my friend Jeff Mayer. He's a photographer. And Jeff's like, okay, Neil, come on, get up. We got to go to the show, I think. And I remember, I think I said, Jeff, look, I think I'm just going to stay here and hang by the pool all day and look at hot chicks laying by the pool. I go, I don't want to fucking go to this show. I I'm beat, you know. I mean, you know, we used to walk around with Nikon F2 cameras, right. which were actually mechanical cameras that had gears and stuff in there. So if you picked up a Nikon F2 and then you picked up a digital camera, the first time I ever picked up a digital camera, I was like, I was at a camera shop. I'm like, oh, yeah, so this is like just a demo floor thing. There's no internals in this camera, though. Oh, this is they're, they're, this is a camera. I go, no, but this it doesn't work. This is just sort of a floor model to show. No, this is a real camera. I'm like, what? The thing probably weighed you know, two or three pounds less than a Nikon F2, which is what I used to use in my heyday. And I also used to bang people in the head with the <laughs> corner of it if it bothered me enough or whatever, you know. And, you, know, yeah. they, you bang something in the head with that, they don't bother you anymore after that. <laughs> yeah, I saw that in your in your documentary about that one guy. <laughs> that you had to hit. Oh yeah. <laughs> so you were there for the jump video, shooting all the shots. Are yeah. these shots being shot during the actual video? Yeah, they were actually, because you know, they shoot it to a, a track. So, you know, whereas if you went to the midnight special or a Don Kirshner's in concert or whatever it was. You couldn't actually film. You had to come during the sound check when they were rehearsing because they didn't want photographers with their motor drives clicking away. So, yeah, that was actually, I mean, you know, for the video, they have to run through it 20, 30 times. So there's plenty of time to you know, shoot, shoot stills. I mean, yeah, but when you were a photographer, when you were a photographer on a, vi on a video set, you're always low man on the totem pole. So they, you know, like you're not Van Halen because I was part of the family, but you know, you go on another thing, you're hired by the record company, go shoot this video. Dude, the, you know, the carry, hey, get out of the way, kid, get out of the way. Hey, you can't stand here, move. You're in my way. Don't do this. Don't do that. You know, I'm pretty much with Van Halen had full reign of access wherever I wanted to go. <laughs> so my buddy, you know, Greg Grinoff, right? I know Greg. I mean, I dealt with him when he came out with his book. I don't think I ever spoke to him or ran into him again after that. But you know, I know well, he had a he had going. a question. He had a question for you, and the question was, when you what did you think of fifty one fifty when you were there? When you saw this place back then, it was like a clubhouse, or what was it like? Well, honestly, it was a fucking pigsty. You know, I mean, That's what I had a big screen TV that was broken and. If I remember, I can't remember. I thought I walked in there with like some dog shit on the floor or something like that. I mean, you know, Eddie wasn't the cleanest person. He's a great musician. You know, guys are slobs, you know. I mean, you know, I'm a slob too. I mean, you know, it's, I mean look at me. I got this picture hanging behind me. It's not even straight, but I didn't straighten up for this thing. I don't care, you know. It's got nothing to do with my photography talent because I'm a slob, you know, so. So I, I, another uh, question that Phil Schaus asked asked me to ask you was, when you were doing those shots with Ed for the Van Halen two, where he was posing in all these different poses, right? Was he just was there music on and and he was just doing stuff and you were just shooting it or how was that? You know that was in seventy eight, but, but I'm sure there was music going on. Now I don't know what I don't know if we put on. Van Halen one right. to listen to that, or he had something else. Maybe we had cream going because he was getting into it pretty good. If you look at those shots, and there's quite a few. Right. I mean, you know, I listen to music from the second I get up in the morning when I'm brushing my teeth, taking a shower in the morning, doing my exercise. I got music on. I was listening to, I think, Pressure and Time, Rival Sons this morning, but right. I got music going. So it's hard for a guitarist to just. You know, you get someone up there and they're just no music, but you put on some music and it makes you move. And, you know, I mean, I, I couldn't live without music. I, I you know, I, I have to hear music all the time. But you but you kind of direct these guys. I mean, like in that case, you, you were you directing him, you think, or not? 
Well, I was pretty wet under the ears back then in 78. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, I wasn't really a, a, a studio photographer. That was pretty much that those were actually shot at, at my studio I was at before I moved here, which was okay. in 79. So I wasn't a great studio photographer. And, you know, believe it or not, when I was younger, I was sort of a shy, bashful kid. And, you know, so I didn't have the big mouth I have now. Now, you know, I could deal with any human being on this planet and be able to ream them a new asshole if I had to. You know, back then I could barely talk to people and look at them face to face in the eye, you know. So, right. you know, I'm just, you know, I, so I probably maybe made some suggestions, you know, now, even though I don't shoot photos anymore, but now, or should I say, you know, five years ago, when I was still doing shooting. Was, I'm yelling and screaming at everybody and I'm trying to pull something out of my subjects because now the new photographer, let's say someone's shooting slash and slash will be like this and they'll just be click, 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 click. And there's no interaction between the photographer. And if I was slash, I'd be sitting here going, is this what the guy wants me to do? I mean, I'm not getting any vibe from the photographer. I'm not getting any feedback. He's not saying anything to me. I'm just sitting here doodling. So, and, you know, but for musicians are not models. They don't know how to pose to make their bodies and their faces and, you know, everything look great, you know? Right. So usually, you know, when in the eighties, I'd shoot all these unsigned bands and they'd get up, up on the backdrop and they'd be like four going, you know, what do you want me to do? And, you know, so I tell them, okay, put your arms like this, but you know, and you lean on this guy and you put your foot forward and you cock your head this way and you turn your chin this way. And, you know, so I got a big mouth in my old age, you know. And, you know, that's and, that's that's part of your that's part of your your, your challenge is to see what looks good and, and bring it out and, and also to get right. To I mean yeah, in this day and age, to me there's no attention to detail with the photographers, you know, and I look and I look for you know strands of hair sticking up or you know their pose are where they got five chins and I tell them to stick their chin out instead of doing this and you know so that just part of me being me, you know, after years and years and years of doing this, you know, and that's probably why I was successful in bands, you know, like Kiss used to always come to me because they knew I uh, would paid attention to detail, you know, when I shot them. So, you know, back then there was no Photoshop and Lightroom. So whatever the photographer shot, that's what the magazines got. You know, the photographer couldn't go into Adobe Photoshop and get rid of five chins or get rid of a fat belly or the hair was wrong here. They couldn't do that, you know. Right. So now everybody fixes everything in the mix, you know. So yeah, it's the same thing on the, on the music side. This is a different photo from fifty one fifty. It looks a little cleaner. <laughs> well, that was uh, that was you know I didn't work with the band after the eighty four tour. You know that's when the band sort of got that Sammy in the band, and you know Sammy's a great entertainer and stuff. But they didn't, you know. They tried to clean house and got rid of all the people who were there in the day there, mm -hmm. <laughs> including me. So I didn't work with them. And then their manager passed away. And, you know, I started working with them again. And it was like, you know, 10 years went by, but it was like no time at all went by, you know. That's so. right. Right. That, that photo, that's, I think, was it 98, maybe somewhere in there? Yeah, it's, it's was probably around, probably earlier. I don't think Gary, those were Gary Sharon days there, but the one you just showed me, I yeah. think, is before yeah. Gary was in the band. Yeah. And there's the. And that, that, those were done at uh, up north, I can't remember, but below San Francisco. Uh, I think I say where it is. I can't remember the name. Oh, no, I can't, I can't remember what it's called. You got to look and help me. Okay. It says, it says for those who are shoreline amphitheater. And then, yeah, shoreline. Yeah. But yeah. those were done at the power station, the the session stuff there. Not that. That that those two were shoreline amphitheater. I think the group shot was done between two buses that were parked backstage. Those are all live shots with Gary. I like the one at Soundcheck where Ed's playing the acoustic guitar the best, actually. Oh. Yeah. I, I can't even see. You got to, yeah, yeah, that one. He looks so happy and 
peaceful because if you look at the ones with Sammy, he had the short hair and the goatee and stuff. But, you know, that was the grunge days in 94, 95. And I guess Ed tried to fit in with that look. But then, you know, when Gary got in the band, he got back to the rock and roll days. And he almost looks more like he did back in the 70s and 80s when I shot him. Yeah, he got like he went back, like you said, that the combat boots and the whole thing and the, the grunge era stuff. Yeah, I don't was, remember when with combat boots, but, you know. That was in that picture from Shoreline. Uh, okay. Construction. Well, yeah, but the, Construction. Yeah, but the Shoreline was back to the uh, – that was the shoreline was back to the rock and roll days. Okay. Yeah, that was good. I had a good conversation with Ed. I think I say in the book, I saw my marriage was going down the tubes and, and it was like, Hey, Lowe's, what's wrong? You don't seem like yourself. I'm like, yeah, my marriage isn't working out. And he was like father Ed back then, you know, so trying yeah. to help get through my rough times with divorce. And, you know, he went through that with Bongo. <laughs> with Bongo. Yeah, Bongo. Bongo from the Belgian Congo, you know. Bongo. Who's still who's still driving me crazy to this day. You know, we've been divorced since 2002. It's 20 years. She's still driving me crazy. Yeah, my wife sat down and watched your documentary the other night. And she watched the whole thing. She had, she had never seen it. I had seen it, but she, she laughed her butt off. This is that last the last thing we were talking about when you went back and met with the with Carlin and, and they did all that, but that photo from I guess this is seventy nine. Well, yeah, that's yeah, but Carlin had nothing to do with that. I think that was in Texas that day, in right. uh, Midlands, Texas. That that was from the cover of Monk's book, if I'm not mistaken. So, all right, one thing I want to ask you about is this right here, this image. You took this image, right? Correct. Okay, whose idea was this, and what was the concept? Once again, Pete Angelus, I believe those are the words to, uh, was it Fairway? Mean Street. Mean, mean Street. Mean Street, yeah. yeah. So there, there was this building right around the block from the Van Halen offices on Sunset where they had management and all worked and everything, and they were tearing it down. So we went there one day, and Pete painted the words on the side of the building and uh, I shot it, and I think that's the inner sleeve. I mean, I have shots with Pete there, and I think Pete shot a picture of me somewhere. There's a picture of me from that, too, you know, doing that. But, yeah, 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 yeah. Ask in, the, in the fuck off Lowe's, which is in one. Yeah, yeah. Is that in that book there? I, I think it is. It's in, one of your, it's in one of your other ones, yeah. Yeah, yeah I so Pete wrote fuck off Lowe's. So. I have another uh, question from Mikey, my friend Mikey. He was asking about this shot. Um, it says kind of what he did here, but this was t like you walked out. And he, he did this often, but you walked out and just shot it. Apparently, uh, yeah. You know, back you know back then, I used to have cameras with me. That's where I live. And right. if any of you ever want to see it, the address is two two six South Fuller Avenue because <laughs> the the building across the street, the blue building, was a place called Motor Measure. It was a auto repair place i nicknamed it motor manglers because they weren't very good but i lived uh there and ed would just he'd be in the neighborhood and you know he'd just knock on my door because i had the very front apartment so right there's a little piece of cement and if you took that cement and walked to the door that's where i lived and that's where it was 226 south fuller i forgot the zip code but right <laughs> off the third street in los angeles I love this photo, man. This is the the, the big VH from '81. Yeah, they just, you know, I mean, God, there's a lot of lights there, and it was just a big production. You know, back then the bands had shows, Motley Crue, and you know, Rat, and even Poison. The first time I saw Poison, oh my God, they're, you know, I didn't know who they were. I was so totally impressed with their stage presence and their whole show for a band that really was, had no money. I think it was at the country club in, in uh, Reseda. And, um, you know, I, I, you know, that's when I latched up with Poison. But, you know, the, the shows back then, they were spectacles, you know. It, was, it wasn't just the music, but it was the visuals also, you know. That's one of the things I try to explain to some of these people that talk about tribute bands. It's like, well, they're bringing back the show. That's part of it. That's why people are attracted to it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Bring it back Fan to Halo, Atomic Punks, you know. It's, it's like you know. somebody asked me the other day why, why I did it. I said, because the chicks dig it. 
<laughs> yeah. Right. yeah that, there was never any shortage of girls at Van Halen shows, too, let me tell you. You, right. know, was, you know, I mean, yeah. I, I think I talked about the beautiful girls story in the book how every night, you know, in Texas. Yeah. They had that, and, you know, after the show, we'd go to these clubs. There was probably 100-plus girls just dressed to kill you know, wanted to be the most beautiful girl in San Antonio, the most beautiful girl in Austin, the most beautiful. And, you know, the band would like walk around, look at all the girls up close. And, you know, and, you, and David, you know what? You girls are all winners. So why don't you all come back to the hotel and hang with us tonight? And there would be like 50 girls at the hotel, just, you know, with the skimpiest, sexiest, hottest outfits, you know ready to do whatever you know they were all ready willing and able you were all you were all what you you were probably not in your early, late 20s early 30s in 79 if you were, yeah. if you were 74 i was 25 I was, <laughs> I, was, I was i was loving life <laughs> right on man god i can't, I can't imagine at 25 doing that all right, so I got a question for you about Eddie's jumping, all right? So this is 84. You said he jumped so high. You were talking about how high he jumped. I noticed him doing this in 81 on tour, but I didn't notice it until 80 or 81, him doing that. Now, Roth always jumped off the risers. Right. I didn't notice that jumping thing happen until later with Eddie. Did you? Uh, well, it? I think there's a photo in my new book from – 81 and it's one of my favorite ones of him jumping it's one of my i guess it's a lot of other people's favorites too because i see all the infringers stealing it from me <laughs> on every website but but yeah i mean eddie i don't remember him jumping so much in 78 79 yeah it became 80. like it became a signature thing for him yeah, I guess, you know, people come into their own. They sort of realize what works, what doesn't work, what they're capable of doing. I mean, you know, jumping with a fucking guitar weighing 10, 15 pounds. I mean, I used to shoot all these guitars for these Japanese magazines. One was Player Magazine that you know, Scorpions would be on tour. And I'd go down and sound check and shoot every guitar and bass or, or Judas Priest or Motley Crue or Rat. And it's funny, you'd pick up a Fender Strat, you know, to put it in the stand, and then you'd pick up a Les Paul, and the Les Paul probably weighed a good 10, 15 pounds more yeah. than the Fender Strat, you know. Sure. So I don't know what kind of wood Ed, you know, Eddie started making his own guitars and modifying them. I think, I can't it was remember. It was heavy. The uh, the original black and white, which turned out to be red and white, black, uh, was made out of ash, and it's super heavy. It's Les Paul heavy. So I don't know if you ever handled that guitar or not, but it's probably was super heavy. You know, I was painting, you know, back in the days when I used to paint cars, like in 79, Ed, you know, used to paint. I'm like, Ed, you know, I paint cars. Why don't you give me a guitar and I'll, I'll paint it for you. So he gave me a guitar and I a body and I primered it. Right. And then I gave it back to him to put the first set of stripes on so I could paint it, whatever. And then about three weeks later, Ed, so where's that guitar you want to finish? Like, dude, I don't know what happened. Dude. I think he got all drunk one night and was it someplace somewhere and just he didn't know what he did with it, you know. <laughs> we used to have a lot of fun. I actually had uh, I actually had a few of my guitars painted by car car guys. Great stuff. Okay. This one for, for some reason uh, this one resonates with me. Does it resonate with other people? Well, that's the one you showed me that was in color in the Ed Buys Lows, but that's from the when they did the album cover shoot for Van Halen, too. That's just a black and white. I mean, you know, the, you know, my new book's all color, okay? There's not was one this, black and white. Was that color, but and then black and white later? No, no, that was... I Back then, I used to shoot black and white and color, you know, <laughs> because... Back then, if you shot in color and the magazines tried to make a black and white out of a color shot, it looked like shit, okay? So I used to shoot black and white with one camera, and I had another camera with color. There was no Photoshop. Now you could take a color and make it black and white. It looks great. But, right, right. you know, that so that was a black and white shot that I did back, in, you know, back then. Here's your picture you're talking about, right? Uh, no, that's not the one I was no, hey. the one I'm talking about is in Ed Buys Lowe's. Okay. It's a full pager. I think it's one. I saw it when you were flipping through, but that's just another one. It's from the same clothes, I think. 
Right, the white panel. Yeah, 81. Now, this image, this is kind of like an a iconic image. It, it, you see in the video this image. I don't know if it just got – it was an actual shot or not, but it looks just like the video. It probably is. I mean, I think uh, Vintage Guitar Magazine used that on the right. cover when Ed passed away. Sure did. There's a, and there's like this great photo of him behind his board when you went back to 5150 that other time. Yeah, yeah. That was, I can't see it that good when you're holding it up, but, you know, I did some stuff there. Uh, not, yeah, I shot him a few times there, but one day I think Ed had a bottle of whiskey day there or something. I don't know if that, my art director got rid of that or maybe he had a Schlitz malt liquor bowl. You know, I used to like drinking that, him and his brother Al back in the day but you know al doesn't drink anymore he hasn't drank for years and obviously ed doesn't drink anymore either so. <laughs> this uh this book a friend of mine he's been taking this book everywhere he goes for the last decade to get every one of your photos signed by the person <laughs> i think i may know who that is i can't remember but i think i think a few people have taken that to quite a few people i mean that was one of my favorite books out of all the books I ever did. Yeah. The funny thing is what I learned, and I'll tell all these people, okay? So a lot of photographers I know, they want to come out with a book of their work, and here's a Kiss photo, and here's a Bon Jovi photo, and here's a Ralph photo. But you know what? Those books don't appeal to any one particular audience, okay? That's more to satisfy the photographer's ego, look, I shot this and I shot that and I did this and I worked with Rob Albert and blah, blah, blah. So I thought with the six string heroes that all the guitarists were going to buy that book and put it on their coffee table because here's all their peers. But what I found out that, look, you got one photo of Bonnie right in there and probably five Jimmy Page and two Jeff Bex and whatever, Eddie Van Halen. If you like Bonnie Raitt, but you don't like Eddie Van Halen or Zach Wilde or Slash. Are you going to buy that book for one photo of Bonnie Rick? So that book there, I mean, there's Johnny Guitar Watson. There's Steve Lukather. There's Neil Sean. There, everybody's in that book, you know. So, But that was probably my worst selling book because it didn't appeal to any one particular audience. So the first book was Van Halen with the Van Halen audience. The second one was Motley Crue went to the Motley Crue fans. The third one was the fuck you book, which is just something to keep in your bathroom to look at when you're taking a dump on the toilet, you know. And that one's a good little fun book, not, nothing to read or whatever. And then we had the Eddie, we had the guitar book and the Eddie book and the Eddie book again. I mean, people can't get enough of Eddie Van Halen, you know. Yeah, it's it's amazing the photos you take. You know what? I was in Cleveland, Ohio at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame by chance about three weeks ago. And I went upstairs to the top of the building, and in that top room, there's a display of Eddie's gear. But when you look through the glass of that of Eddie's gear, on the end of it is a picture that you shot of Eddie in the studio at Sunset Sound too. And it's that one of those icons with a cigarette in his mouth, and it's a really cool. I know. Uh, hey, do you live in Ohio? No, I live in North Alabama, Huntsville. Uh, oh yeah, hey, you told me that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but I, yeah, I was up there just because I'd never been there. To the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So, how, how long ago was that you were there? Two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Okay, so you saw my photo up there, right? Oh yeah, yeah, okay. full size, like life size. Well, just curious, was there any plaque that said "photo by Niels Lozo" or anything, or nothing? I believe it had your name down at the bottom. I'll look. Okay, I'll look. I might have it in my phone. Let's see. Take a look. I have a photo of that. I didn't see anything. They didn't get that print from me. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> they didn't? Oh, God. No. <laughs> well, I'm, you know. But, but you, it was life-size. It's huge, right? It is, it's life-size, yeah. It, and what's cool about it is the way it looks through the glass. It looks like he's in the studio through the glass. But it's black and white. And uh, it's yeah, really cool. I know it's right. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, yeah don't I'm, worry about my game now, but... Yeah, I'll let you know. Yeah, that's crazy, man. So, you know, just to kind of close it out, you know, all these folks, you you know, you were, you started in 71, you said? Is that right? No, I started in 69, but that was just me being a fan, taking my camera to a Rolling Stone show. But, you know, it was, you know, once, 
once you're in the very front row hanging with your idols, Mick and Keith, you know, it was like, you know, and I was in 69, I was uh, 15, you know, I was like, God, God, goo, goo, you know, like every, you know, <laughs> you know, everybody, you go to a concert and you're like 20 rows back <laughs> and the nose, you see the photographers in the pit and everybody's like, oh man, look at that guy down there. He's like two inches from Mick Jagger, or two inches from Eddie Van Halen. And everybody wants to do that, you know, it's like, you know, and, and nowadays, I mean, you know, anybody can get a photo pass and all you need to do is write a blog or anything. Back then, when I started, there weren't a lot of people doing it, you know, and so right. getting a photo pass was hard and it was a big ordeal, you know, contacting publicists or whatever. So let me ask you this about out of focus, Ollie, <laughs> when, you, when you said this about you say this in your documentary. I was yeah. thinking about how you 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 know you like the photo sharp versus the depth of field kind of thing. I mean, is that is that correct to say that? Well, no. I mean, it's a general depth of field. Depth of field. I just want if I'm shooting someone, I want that the person to be sharp, but out of focus. All Oliver or his name's Todd Gray, but I called him. You know, when we were in uh, junior high together, and every time he was one of these. Like I was the shy kid back there when we were partners and he was, you know, always wanted to hang and go to the parties and he was the socialite and I was the sort of shy kid who couldn't look anybody in the face. So, but whenever he'd go to the chalkboard, when the teacher like, does anybody know the answer to this question? Out of, out of focus, Oliver would go up there and he would always sign his name, Todd Oliver Gray. Instead of not just Todd, but Todd Oliver Gray. Well, back then, they had a show called Green Acres, which to this day, I still watch at 930 on me TV <laughs> at night after Gomer Pyle. And so back then, the show was really, you know, popular. And they had Ava Gavor and she's like, Oliver, Oliver, because the husband of Oliver Wendell Douglas. So I started calling him Oliver because he seemed to always put Oliver on the chalkboard. So he became Oliver. I still to this day call him Oliver. I don't call him Todd. You know, I call him Oliver. So. <laughs> I to make sure I got all my but questions. He, he, he just couldn't focus as good as me for some reason. I was always a sharpness fanatic. I want to see the the indentations between everybody's teeth. I want to see the individual hairs. I want to see their eyelashes. But you know, I hate just photos that are out of focus. I don't like them. You know, yeah, that's just sure. depth of field. Depth of field is something totally different than being out of focus. You know? Right, right, right. So Lori, Lori uh, Tucker was one of my guests, and you know who I'm talking about, right? Yeah, I know Lori Tucker. She was on here recently. The uh, Hot for Teacher shoot. <laughs> what can you tell me about that? Uh, you know, we did that. It was a three-day shoot at some school and probably two miles from where I'm sitting. And, you know, they had these drop-dead beautiful chicks, you know, that were the – the girls in there, the teacher and some other ones. And, uh, you know, it was three long days. I remember the best thing I remember, honestly, was at the very end, it was day three. And I saw Waldo outside sitting at this bench. And I he didn't look too happy. I go, hey, Waldo, what's up, man? You know, you don't look too happy. He's like, man, he goes, you know, Dave, you know, saw my hair and didn't think it looked greasy enough. So he took this tub of Vaseline and, shoved his hands and started putting it in my hair. Waldo's like, that was on the, per the first day. He goes, I've been trying to get this stuff out of my hair, man. I used Ajax and Comet and shampoo and, you know, made it sound like gasoline, paint remover, acetone. <laughs> he, he couldn't get the Vaseline out of his hair. By day three, Waldo looked pretty miserable. Everybody was sort of miserable by day three, you know, so. So one other question before we go. You know, you saw these guys from, like you said, from the very beginning where they're, they're just nobodies, really, and, and they became these giant stars by 84. You know, how did that impact them and, and you know, what you saw? I mean, I know we all know they came, came apart in 84, and you mentioned that, the tension in the 84 tour. I mean, how, how did that play out in your mind, what you saw? Well, you know, just like I said, Buddha taught me everything changes and nothing stays the same. So in the beginning, they were one big happy family. And, you know, all the bands are like that Motley, Rat, Poison, Guns N' Roses. You know, they're all 
have no money. They're all living in the one bedroom apartment. They're all eating Taco Bell, McDonald's, you know, because they have no money. Usually whatever chicks they're boning at the time are supporting them. And they usually end up all boning the same chick anyway. And then, uh, you know, it gets to the point where like, okay, well, I made some money, so I'm going to buy a Lexus. Well, then the other guy in the band's like, oh, you got a Lexus? Well, I'm going to do one better. I'm going to get a Maserati or I'm going to buy a Mercedes or whatever. And then, you know, one guy has this hot chick and she's got a size 38 rack. So, you know, the drummer's got to buy his girlfriend a size 40 rack to outdo the guy with the 38. And, you know, and it gets animosity and jealousy and everything. So, you know, like I told you, in my mind, Ed and now they were the musical part of that band. You know, they, you know, they were two brothers. They were, were more brotherly than almost any two brothers I ever met in my life, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, Dave, sort of, even though Eddie was the big guitar star, I think Dave was always in the limelight, you know, with the People magazine, whatever it is, you know, didn't I think he didn't get his fucking dick insured for like, you know, millions of dollars, you know, all these stunts like that. So Dave was getting all the publicity and I, I think it eventually took its toll and there was some jealousy and animosity and so on. And, you know, I don't remember, I think still back in 84, they all had the same dressing room, but I've seen bands, they, you know, they could go on stage for two hours and make it work. And then once they get off stage, they don't even want to talk to each other. They hate each other. Yeah. Now, I don't think the band yeah. hated each other because you have to work together when you're in a band. Sure. It's rough. I mean, you know, I remember when I was younger, Jimi Hendrix experience broke up, Cream broke up, you know, Ian Gillen left Deep Purple. And, you know, I just, you know, I was sort of heartbroken. I couldn't understand how this could happen when a band like Cream was so huge. But, you know, the personalities and everything, they just, you know, they start fighting, there's jealousy and everything, and the, the bands fall apart. You know, musically, though, you know, like you'd see Richie Blackmore and Ian Gillen, they pretty much hated each other, but there's that tension, or Joe Perry and Steven Tyler, tension, you know, Mick Jagger, Keith Richards, tension, but sometimes musically that helps, but as far as being friends and, you know, it doesn't help at all, you know. Yeah. So, you, so you did know, you after your... 1980, go on. So, so there's always been talk that when Valerie Bertinelli came into the picture, that Roth was jealous and had started some of the animosity. Because you know, I don't know. You know, I mean, what? You know, let's just say once Valerie came into the picture, it was game over for Ed because he was in love. You know, I mean, Valerie Bertinelli back then was was this hot little <laughs> sexy TV starlet goddess, right. and you know, then Ed and Val actually sort of looked similar. And you know, I mean, I was there actual wedding photographer that they hired to shoot their wedding right. you know, because they trusted me, at least Ed trusted me. I didn't know Valerie that good, but you know, Dave had no problem with hot chicks. You know, Dave was, you know, every night with, you know, a different hot chick or whatever. So I don't think he was jealous, but it's sort of more like the Yoko Ono thing. You know, you hear you got Valerie in the picture and She's probably some way, oh, oh, you know, Ed, you're really the star of this band. You know, and that Dave's taken away. So I don't think, I don't think Dave was jealous at all and wanted Valerie. I just think, you know, the band's business is the band's business. But when outsiders, even though she's now married to Ed, sort of, you know, you, you, you should, you know, whatever, whether she's saying, you know, I don't know what their business cut was money wise or anyway, but maybe Valerie's saying, you know, Ed, you're really the star. You should be getting more money than anybody else in this band because you're really the guitar. I, I don't know what went on, but right. I don't think Dave was jealous of Valerie. I just think maybe he didn't like her sticking her nose in whatever music business because, you know, Ed didn't stick his nose in her TV business, I don't think, saying, hey, sure. Valerie, you should get more money than these other people on one day at a time. So I don't know what went down, but I don't think Dave was jealous. Sure, that just, you know, changes the dynamic in a in a, in a, a group of people when you have another person come in that you don't know and you don't know what their deal yeah. is. Yeah, we get yeah, that. Like everybody, yeah, everybody hated in the Beatles. They all hated Yoko Ono, you know, so it was probably Change, whatever, you know. Change the dynamic. Did you see the documentary? Beatles documentary. No, I don't watch too many. I, I did just 
watch Great Balls of Fire, the Jerry Lee Lewis, you know, movie with right. Dennis Quaid, which isn't a documentary, it's a movie. Right. But that's uh, that that that's I mean, Jerry Lee Lewis, people who know me know he was one of my idols in life. You know, I love little Richard, he's gone, Chuck Berry's gone, Jerry Lee Lewis gone now, but you know, he's great. There's another movie I'll tell you guys if, if you want to watch it. It's called Cadillac Records. And that movie's fantastic, too. That's more the story of chess records, you know, with Etta James and Muddy Waters. And that movie's fantastic, too. So Great Balls of Fire, Cadillac Records. I love those two. And I don't really need to watch a documentary on someone, you know, like a two-hour doc. I started watching them before. I watched a Keith Richards one before my documentary came out on me. I couldn't watch much of that Keith Richards one. I thought it was terrible. And we saw Jimi Hendrix one. I was there with Declan, the guy who did my documentary, lives in Austria, because we just wanted to check out what was being done. And the Jimi Hendrix one wasn't bad, but they had someone else talking, trying to be Jimi Hendrix's voice, talking, and that one didn't last long. And I think we started watching a David Bowie one. I don't really like watching documentaries too much. So check check this story out I'm, on my on my podcast. The guy who pro provided those bootlegs I was telling you about earlier, Mike Wolf is his name. Mike was a guitar player for a minute in King Cobra with Carmine. Wait and a second. I did lots of work for King Cobra. I don't remember Mike Wolf. There was uh, it was Rick. He was like in there for a second. <laughs> okay, that's why I don't remember him. Yeah, yeah, I was like in there for a second. So anyway, but you okay? So King Cobra, wait, which their first record was phenomenal. The very first King Cobra record. It. Yeah, I loved it. And the second one was one of the worst records I ever heard in my <laughs> life. But okay, so go on, Mike. Wolf. All right, so Mike Wolf, this person who gave Ed these these uh these demos, Ooh, decides that he's going to. Uh, he tells Ed about a documentary about Van Halen that was playing on uh, one of the uh, one of the TV channels. His music, Palladia, I think. And Ed says he wants to see it. So, so Mike makes a copy. He goes up there with Ed and he watches it with Ed. And Janie, his wife, comes in. And he's like, she don't even know who this guy is in her living room. And he gets done with the documentary and he goes, "What do you think, Ed?" And he goes, ah, "I lived all that. I don't need to see that shit." <laughs> Yeah, I, I know. I mean, uh, I forgot, it was, you know, the movie, I forgot what it was, but it was the same thing. I mean, you know, the rock star came out the movie with Mark Wahlberg, and I didn't see that for a year, even though I'm in the movie. I play myself in the movie. <laughs> I remember but that. It, it, yeah, but I literally didn't watch it until the very, it came out the weekend of 9-11, so that's 20 uh, the 2001. I didn't watch it in 2002, I think in August when it came out. So it was almost a year after it came out that I watched it. But there was something else. Oh, I know what it was. It was the dirt, the Motley Crue thing. So when it came out, you know, Nikki was one of my closest friends, me, him, and Robin Crosby. You know, we were like the fearsome threesome. So he's one of my best friends. And the dirt came out, and everybody's like, Oh, Neil, you know, do you see the dirt? And I go, Dude, I was Nikki's best friend. I, I don't need to see that. I lived that. I was there from, you know, 83 to 91 with Motley. So I, I didn't need to see that. But I eventually did see that movie. And I thought it was really good. I mean, I even wrote to Nikki after because we didn't talk for a long time. Let's just say we had a little falling out. But we're fine now as far as I'm concerned. And I actually, after I saw the movie for the first time, I wrote to Six and said, hey, Six, I really didn't want to, but... I saw the dirt last night and all I could say is I thought it was fantastic. And when the music came in, like when I was watching it, I got my TV hooked up to my stereo. When they went and did live wire, which is the first song they do and it sounded incredible. I don't know how they mixed it, but it was just boom. Like right there, it sounded amazing. You know, so nice. six was a back. Oh yeah. As low as thanks, man. We worked really hard on that movie, blah, blah, blah. So, so, but I said the same thing. I lived it. I was there with Nikki during the, that, the Us Festival and all that. I didn't need to see the dirt, you know. Right, man. Well, you've, you've had such an incredible life. I mean, you know, I know you're not shooting much. Are you shooting? If if, if Steve Vai calls you tomorrow and wants to do a shoot, are you going to shoot him in the studio? No. Live? First of all, 
let's just say I have one or two motorcycles downstairs. Okay. There's no room to shoot photos here. <laughs> I, the last shoot I did was with this comedian named Greg Hahn, uh -huh. who I saw in Las uh -huh. Vegas the night after I saw Van Halen in January. Right. And Greg right. Hahn, H-A-H-N, to me was like the Beatles of comedy. So he asked me to do a shoot. I'm like, dude, I don't shoot anymore. And then I got off the phone. I'm like, you know what? This guy's like the Beatles of comedy. I go, it would be an honor for me to work with this comedian. You know, and I've there's no one really I haven't shot in the music industry except Elvis, the Grateful Dead, and the Beatles. But to me, shooting this comedian, Greg Hahn, was like shooting the Beatles. So he's the last photo shoot I did. Now, I did go out with this girl yesterday who's a clothing designer. She does incredible clothes. Her name's Sherry Lou. She wants me to do a shoot. And I'm like, Sherry, I don't shoot anymore. I don't shoot anymore. I may do a shoot with her. I don't, it's just, it's not in my heart to do photos anymore. I don't, I, to me, being a photographer is the most useless, pathetic occupation on this planet. But I may do something with Sherry. Maybe. You know, because she does incredible clothes. That's why. Right. Well, you know, you, you, pick, you can pick and choose. You're You've been doing this forever, and if you want to do something, you can. If you don't want to do anything, go. I don't. I don't even pick and choose. It just no. Vi call me and want me to do something. No. Satriani call me up. No. Whoever <laughs> call me, even Slash. I've known Slash since 1983. I don't want to do them. There's. I mean, no one. Honestly, I have Vi from '86. You know, on. I got Satriani from '88 on. I got Slash from '87. Guns of the Roses on. I don't need to shoot Slash in 2022 or Vi in 2022 or anybody in 2022. You know, you, you think the Rolling Stones, if I go shoot them now, do you think I can sell photos of like 78-year-old guys on stage? No, no. They want the shit that I shot billions of years ago in the Stone Age, you know. So did you shoot Hendrix? I saw Jimi Hendrix four times. That was before I ever shot photos. I mean, I forgot what year. I think Jimmy died in 69, maybe 70. I can't remember. But I started shooting photos in November of 1969, the Stones at the Forum, November 69. Okay. It was September. September 70. 70 uh, he died? September of 70. Yeah. Jimmy? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I couldn't remember in 69 or 70. I was in high school, but. I started high school in 69. So, so you saw Eddie and him. What do you, I mean, how do you com contrast them? Well, they were both innovators. I mean, no one to play guitar like Jimi Hendrix when he came on the scene. No one. Sorry. No. And no one played guitar like Ed did when he came on the scene. I mean, there's thousands of Eddie imitators now, you know, I, I mean, which, you know, they say imitation is the greatest form of flattery. You know, like Derek and Van Halen, he pretty much plays it note for note. There's a couple notes that are a little different, but, you know, but, you know, there's, you know, tons of guitars that can play just the same shit Ed played, you know, so. Yeah, it's amazing that, it's amazing the children that he, I have a kid out there with, out in San Bernardino who's building me an amp and he's only, he's only 16 and he's an Ed freak. And uh -huh. he, he's building me a tube amp that's a copy of one of the Ed's early 70s amps. And right. I, I'm like, when I was talking to him, I was like, how old are you? And he's like, at the time, he was like 15. I was like, what? <laughs> how do you know all this Van Halen stuff, bro? It's insane. Well, yeah, I mean, listen, you know, I tell people there's probably guitarists on this planet now that are 100 times better than Ed, but... All they know how to do is sit in their bedroom 28 hours a day and practice and play guitar. It doesn't matter how great you are unless you get out there and know how to promote yourself and make yourself available to the public, which people now can easily do with YouTube and Internet, you know, Instagram and stuff. They didn't have that when, you know, back in the Stone Age, you know, when Ed was around or Jimi Hendrix. So you had to know how to promote your band and you had to go play live and get your name out there. Now, you know, there's people that are just Internet sensations that never need to leave their bedroom but you know so like i said there's probably guitars out there that are a hundred times better than ed could ever hope to be but no one ever sees them or knows their name or hears them because they don't know how to promote themselves 
you know. Right, right, right. It's a different, definitely different. Ed said that when I saw, I actually saw Ed at that, the Smithsonian thing that he did. I was there for that. And he talked about how much they busted their ass. And he said he didn't think that there was any difference between now and 78. You just had to get out there and do it. You know, you, you know. Just well, was, there it is because you don't have to get out there and do it. You can just go put your iPhone here and, you know, like <laughs> shoot yourself doodling on the guitar and hopefully, you know, you got to sell yourself on the internet somehow. So, true, true. It's quite different. Well, man, thank you for, for coming on today, brother. I, you know, it's been oh. a... It's been a lifetime since I I got the Van Halen Diver Down album and a lifetime since I've seen your name on there. And, you know, indirectly, you inspired me through these photos to play guitar my entire life and also to have a career doing this, you know, doing something I love. So if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be talking to you. <laughs> oh, well, I, I had a good time. And all I can say is, you know what, folks? This may sound like a plug, but Christmas time is coming up. So if you want to give a good present, you can uh, go to zloz.com, Z-L-O-Z.com, and you can order the Ed by Zloz book. And, you know, there's a lot of unseen photos. Everybody's seen a lot of my photos, Ed, but we made a special point to pick out photos that have never been seen before. The book's not cheap, but every single person who's bought it and wrote back to me says they just think it's incredible and fantastic and it it's selling great i don't really have a lot more left but you know i got some i don't think it, i didn't think it was expensive at all for what you did man i mean geez not for what it is uh you know there's a couple other ed books out there and a couple people bought one particular one and they said they thought they got ripped off and jilted by that and they sold it on ebay or whatever so uh you know i think everybody's been really really with my well, book. you have the biggest resource and the best pictures out there, Van Halen. You know, we, we all know that. I mean, that's been everybody that, that knows you, every artist that worked with you, everybody knows about the Van Halen thing. I'm sure all of them tell, talk to you about Van Halen, right? Every freaking artist that comes uh, in. There, there's a lot of Van Halen freakazoids out there, you know, including <laughs> me. You know, so. Right. Well, thanks again, man. I, I don't want to keep you all day, but thank you for your time. And uh, anything you need from me, let me know. I'll put this together and put it out. And uh, okay, and I'll start promoting to get it out there for you. Sounds good, Jeff. I appreciate you having me on the show, and long live Van Halen. That's right, brother. Thank you very much. Let me know if you need anything. Okay, you got all my right, number. See you, all <laughs> See you, buddy. All right, bye bye. Take it easy, Jeff. Uh, bye bye. bye, -bye.